Good morning. Good morning. I'm Bill Ackerman. I'm the clerk of section here at McGregor. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you here today for this worship service, whether it be present or online. If you are a visitor and would like to have more information about McGregor, we welcome you to talk with any of us after the service today. With the reduction of COVID cases and the relaxation of mask guidelines from the CDC, we are returning to more normal pre-COVID worship practices. Thank the Lord. The pews are no longer roped off in the sanctuary and the decision to wear a mask in our church buildings is left up to the individual. Our adult six-week Lenten book study begins this afternoon at 4 p.m. in McGregor Hall. The class will be led by the Reverend Allison Bell. We will study the Amy Jill Levine book, Witness at the Cross, A Beginner's Guide to Holy Friday. The class is also accessible by Zoom using the link in the newsletter or flock note email. If you are interested in participating in the historic Columbia tour of the Majeska Simpkins home on March the 26th, please contact Christina Eisenhower before March 17th to make your reservation. Today we will be observing communion. We're asking that you come down the center aisle and receive the elements from those who are giving out the elements and take them back to your seat. Get the elements and take them back to your seat by the side aisles and we will take those elements together. If you are at home and are participating in communion, be sure to have your juice and bread available there. We're very, very glad today to have Pam Tabor back with us uh, to give us our message today. Welcome back, Reverend Tabor. Thanks. And now let us prepare for worship by observing a few moments of silence.
pray to God that the opening prayer as found in your book. Almighty God of love, you show us your love in many ways, but we do not always show our love for you or others. We do not stop listening. We get so caught up in our own concerns that we forget about the most important thing in the world, our relationship with you. We get lazy and go along with deeds of greed, pride, and prejudice. Lord God, help us to face up to the reality of our failures. Guide us so that as you move towards us with mercy, we may repent through Jesus Christ our Lord. The good news of the gospel is absolutely true and dependable. Paul tells us in Romans that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. So I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that our sins are forgiven.
The Gospel reading for this morning is uh, from the Gospel of John, reading from chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. You can follow along if you wish to from the back of the hymnal or in your pew Bible. Hear the word of the Lord. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it, and when the, it was a wine steward, when the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. But then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory. And his disciples believed him. This is the word of the Lord. I like to snack. You can probably look at me and tell that, but <laughs> um, one of my favorite snacks is not too bad for you. It's really not. Uh, I like grapes. I like grapes a lot. Uh, whether it's white or red, a grape is, you know, just satisfying. It really is. Can't beat that taste. And you can do some pretty interesting things with grapes, too. The juice of the grape is filling. If you ever fast or are having to go a day without eating, try white grape juice. It really is very filling. You, you can uh, go a, a without eating and, you know, be okay. But it is really sweet. Yeah. It does not have the true balance of flavors that you get in the whole you can also dry grapes and eat raisins. And raisins stay good forever. <laughs> you don't have to worry about them going bad. But boy, are they dry. They really are. They don't have any wonderful juice. And then you can make wine out of grapes. I took this culinary arts class at the Disney Institute once. If you've never been to the Disney Institute, it's Walt Disney World. It's day camp for adults. <laughs> and you can take all sorts of classes. And this culinary arts class was entitled Wine, Wonders, and Song. It was a great deal of fun. And I learned a lot about grapes, believe it or not. We peeled it. We ate some of the skin of the grape. Eh, very, very unsatisfying. If you've done that, it's really bitter. And it's you know, kind of dry, dries out your mouth. Then we ate some of the pulp. A lot more satisfying. And, but, you know, really kind of sweet. But then the whole class ate our grapes, whole grapes, together. It was a 
perfect blend of dryness, frigidness, sweetness, and juiciness. The whole was much better than the parts. And our instructor went on to explain that's what makes the perfect wine. Balance. You need that balance. Human beings over the years have spent a lot of time and energy perfecting the balance of good wine. Wine's been a part of human civilization since the very beginning. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of the good life, and it's a symbol of celebration. Judaism recognizes two special foods that are appropriate for religious celebration. They are, not surprisingly, bread and wine. In these foods, the people say, God's good gifts and human ingenuity are seen to be equal, equally represented. God gives the grape and the grain. Humans combine ingredients together and make wine and bread. In wine and bread, the balance between human and divine are recognized, and that's why they're such a wonderful religious symbol. Divine and human together, creating satisfying food and drink. Food that gives life, and more than that, food that brings joy. Bread and wine are used each week in the Jewish celebration of the Sabbath. The prayer is for each item, Blessed art thou, O King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. And you have a cup. And blessed art thou, O King of the universe, who bringest forth the bread of the earth. And bread is a joy. Now, grain is a very, very important part of our diet. It's at the bottom of the food pyramid, or what used to be the food pyramid. <laughs> Bread is the staff of life. And wine, well, wine is a symbol of abundance. It's said that wine is used in celebrations because it's the drink of joy. It warms the heart and brings a glow to the face. <laughs> Each year at the Seder Passover meal, the special meal that Jews celebrate to remember the deliverance from Egypt, they have four, count them, four cups of wine that each has a special blessing, and bread, a very special bread with a special blessing. As part of that ceremony, they also recount the ten plagues that afflicted the Egyptians. And since all pain lessens our joy, they take a spoon as a part of that celebration, and they, every time a plague is lifted, they dump out a little bit of wine. Because even the pain of the Egyptians lessened our joy. Since all pain lessens joy, we have to remember that as a part of the symbolism that goes along with the celebrations. A wedding is also a special celebration that requires the use of wine in Judaism. Once a couple has been legally united in marriage, the celebrant raises a cup and says, a blessing, and it is, for the fruit of the vine, for creating the universe, for creating human beings, for creating human beings in his image, in such a fashion that they in turn can create life. For his grace, as he will make Zion joyful again, through the return of her children, for making the bride and the groom joyful May he bring gladness to them 
as he brought it to his creatures in the Garden of Eden. For him, who as the source of all joy is implored to restore speedily to the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of joy. Blessed are you, Lord. You are he who makes the groom rejoice with the bride. That prayer and cup are reminders that God is bound to Israel by marriage. That passage from Isaiah talked about it. But the words of the prayer also remind us that this joy, this marriage, is not yet complete. It hasn't been consummated. May that day soon come, the prayer says, and may the couple who now join together be there to see it when it all comes together. The cup is passed to the bride and the groom. They drink it, sharing the cup of life together. Following the pronouncement, the groom drops the empty glass and steps on it, breaking it. The hope of a consummated union with God is expressed in the prayer and the sharing of the cup, and then a symbol of reality is used to express the sorrow that the day of consummation has not yet come. The people's joy is diminished. That day will only come, that day of fulfillment with the bridegroom will only come with the Messiah. That is the kind of celebration that Jesus and the disciples and his mother attended at Cana. It was a celebration just filled with symbols. Not surprisingly, most of these symbols and customs have carried over into Christianity with, you know, some changes and some added stuff. Weddings for all cultures, though, are times of joy, or you know, at least as the way it's supposed to be. Our image of the perfect marriage is one in which the ceremony just goes perfectly, and every bride and groom have this image of a perfect celebration. I've done a few wedding celebrations over the years. I have yet to see that perfect celebration. As a matter of fact, weddings can bring out the worst in human beings, amazingly so. One of my friends who got married, her grandmother decided that was the time to get drunk and run around the service talking to all her relatives and telling them exactly what she felt about them. And it wasn't pretty. <laughs> Some ceremonies have had to deal with the difficulties of marriages where there has been a divorce and remarriage. Now, trying to get exes together can be a real experience. I did one wedding where the mother said if her ex-husband brought that woman into her sanctuary, she would blow up the, the building. <laughs> well, that was us there, Julie. <laughs> Believe it or not, the wedding happened. Everything was okay. But so much for that unity. They still did all the symbols, the, you know, the candle, candles, lighting candles, and uh, never-ending circles that we exchange. And in the Jewish tradition, the cup of wine is shared. Compared to some weddings I've been to, the wedding at Cana actually went surprisingly well until they got to the reception, which actually lasted for several days. So you can understand why they were running out of wine. I mean, they really did celebrate for days. Think of what that might have meant symbolically, though. <laughs> Did that mean the marriage would run out of joy? Oh, no. The 
people in charge of the wedding knew they were going to run out when it started running low. They could see the supplies. And, you know, what are they going to do? They can't run to Publix. They get a few extra bottles. They always want one. But a wedding celebration without wine? Like a day without sunshine, only worse. A wedding without wine would symbolically be an empty celebration without joy. Happens though, you know. Despite the best laid plans, we run out of things. Things that we think are important. Wine, milk when it snows. Joy. joy. Sometimes we run out. You know, even celebrities that we think have this great fine life can feel like they're running low. A few years ago, at the People's Choice Award, Whoopi Goldberg was thanking the people for giving her a Lifetime Achievement Award. And she said it came at a really good time because she was feeling low. She was feeling empty, and this gave her confidence in her career again. It restored her joy for a moment, made her feel better. I don't know about you, but I felt empty on more than one occasion. I don't think anybody's going to give us an award to make us feel better. But even if they did, would that fill the emptiness? Yeah, maybe for a little bit. Maybe, maybe. Usually though, when I'm running on empty, it's because I've lost touch with the true sense of love and joy in the universe. I've lost it. I've just lost it. Accomplishment feels a need, but it isn't. That basic bread and wine need that it's had all humans. That basic need runs deep. And when you feel empty, it is a deep, dark void. What do you do? What do you do when there's no joy? When your glass is completely empty and you just want to break it? What we do is we want it. We seek fulfillment anywhere we can. If you watch the evening news, you can see that there are people out there trying to fill that emptiness with all kinds of stuff. Drugs, power, money, sex, violence. It is all around us. These things might fill us with emotion and purpose, for a moment, but in the long run, they make the emptiness worse. So when we're running on empty, when there's no more wine, what do you do? Where do you turn? To things that can satisfy that basic need to real bread and wine. Jesus' mom knew where to turn. She knew who had the ability to answer that need. He was standing right beside her. So she said, Jesus, they're out of wine. Well, that was obvious. Jesus knew that all of humanity was out of wine, out of joy. Without a joy that could really satisfy them. The connection between human and creator was just broken, incomplete, so we were never fulfilled. But he says to his mom, it's not time yet. What a strange answer to give to his mother. But Jesus knew. <laughs> you know, it was time 
for wine. Yeah, uh, the bride and the groom and the guests certainly knew that. It was the groom's responsibility to provide good wine for the guests, and this groom had failed to do it. He certainly knew it was time for wine, but it was not yet time for Jesus to be the bridegroom of God's chosen to provide the wine that could truly satisfy all needs. That time would be upon him in a few years, but not quite yet. However, this was a good time for some foreshadowing. It's no accident that <laughs> the Gospel of John puts this story as the first of Jesus' miracles. This is John's Advent story. This is the revelation of Emmanuel, God with us. As usual in John's stories, there's a great deal of symbolism in the act of Emmanuel in this story. Here we have the first sign of who Jesus really is and what he has come to do. Jesus has come to be the bridegroom. He is the Messiah who will consummate the relationship between God and his people and make Zion and the world joyful again. He'll restore the voice of mirth and joy. He'll fill the empty glass at the messianic bank. That's what he's come to do, but not quite yet. Now he'll come after a period of total emptiness at the cross. For now, though, a sign is given, a clue to who he is and what he will do, a symbol of things to come. And what a symbol it is. Jesus just doesn't, you know, doesn't just give us a hint here. He does it up big. They need wine? You give them a couple of bottles? Jugs, jugs and jugs and jugs of good wine, filled to the brim, and it was really good. This wine was great. The Messiah, fully God and fully human, provides wine that is truly balanced. The wine steward is so impressed that he offers his compliments to the group. This is unusual, he says. Normally people get the best one they can and serve it first. But you save the best until now. The groom had offered the best he could, but this was much better. God's wine is far better than anything humans can provide. God's wine can satisfy. When we're empty, when we're out of joy, and don't know where to turn. All we have to do is look beside us. He's there. He's there. God is with us, Emmanuel. And our Lord knows our emptiness. Emmanuel came and experienced human life. Jesus, God with us, knows our and stands ready to fulfill our needs. All we have to do is reach out. Reach out and receive the gifts of God that are offered. The world offers awards and rituals that mimic the divine, but only God can truly provide joy, real joy. Only the Messiah serves balance. We celebrate the gift God has given us in Christ as we join at the table of the Lord today. And all of us are invited. Thanks be to God.
As we gather, we remember the gifts that God has given to us. And at this time, we give thanks for those gifts and return a portion of what God has given us to the work of the church and the work of McGregor. If you are here in the sanctuary, there is a uh, offering plate in the back. And if you are listening to us on Zoom, please mail your checks to the church. And we are grateful for all that God has given us. We do come to this table today from all directions, all places, all situations. But every one of us is equally invited to this table of our Lord where we celebrate together. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks for the bread and the cup that you have given to us. Fill us, Lord. May these elements become for us true joy, the true source of life, and remind us that you are that perfect fulfillment of the promise. All this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. When we come, we come remembering what our Lord did on the night in which he was betrayed when he took bread and he broke it after he had blessed it and he said this is my body which is given for you the same way after supper he took the cup and when he blessed it he said this is the blood of the covenant all of you, drink of it. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And all is ready.
bread of life. The cup of salvation. Let us pray. God, our help, we thank you for this supper shared in the Spirit with your Son, Jesus, who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal, who grants us strength in times of emptiness. We pray for our world, Lord, which seems empty in so many ways. Fill us, Lord, that we too may reach out and help others. We pray for peace in our world. We pray for healing for our world. We praise you, Lord. We praise you for giving us all good gifts. And we pledge ourselves to serve you, even as in Christ you have served us. Amen. of strength and power and healing and love. So may the peace of Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit go with us all this day and every day. Amen.